Hi, thanks for coming. It's my great pleasure to introduce Rabi al Madin tonight. Rabi was born in Jordan to Lebanese parents. He grew up in Kuwait and Lebanon and received an undergraduate degree in engineering from UCLA, followed by an MBA from the University of San Francisco. He worked as an engineer, but also pursued a passion for painting with great success. He was al al already a renowned artist when he published his first novel, Kool-Aids, in 1998. His eye for visual detail is evident in this book, which is a kind of collage, a medley of Lebanese and American voices which speak from the center of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco and the civil war in Lebanon. Um, the Se Seattle Times wrote, um, to tell the stories of these characters, al has constructed a collage that integrates every genre under the sun. Fictional diary entries by a Lebanese mother, real AP news stories, internet news group postings, soliloquies, hallucinations, and short plays. The latter performed by the likes of Julio Cortazar, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Tom Cruise, who looks a little lost. More often than not, these fragments are violent or sexually explicit, yet they're always beautiful in their hard lyrical insistence on the material reality of the terror of our century." Close quote. In 1999, Rabi published The Perv, a collection of short stories. In the title story, a pedophile corresponds with a 13-year-old Lebanese-American boy who is just discovering his own homosexuality. Or, in fact, this titular Perv may in fact be writing to an aging recluse who's dying of AIDS and for his own pleasure pretending to be a young boy. This confrontation with what makes us uncomfortable with desire, fear, death, longing marks all the stories in the book. Publishers Weekly wrote, these stinging narratives vibrate with an electrical tension that comes partly from Alamuddin's liking for the outrageous, partly from his unflinching view of a society in chaos. His interest in formal experimentation is evident in I, the Divine, which followed in 2001. The book is an entire series of first chapters. That is, the first chapters of a memoir by a woman, Sarah Nur el Uddin, who's trying to write her, her memoir. Um, and she never uh, succeeds in finishing the first chapter and going beyond. So it's, the whole book is a series of failed first chapters. Um, and each of the chapters um, vary not just in content, but in tone, texture, and feeling. The incomplete fragments come together to give us Sarah in all her complexity and contradiction. Uh, the UK Times wrote, not only is this, is this form brilliantly executed, it is so convincing that it feels like the only valid way that al could have told Sarah's story. The picture comes together slowly, but arriving as it does in a non-linear order allows insights from unexpected directions. I first read Rabi's work when a friend sent me his latest novel, The Hakavati, with a note that said, just read this. The book begins, listen, allow me to be your God. Let me take you on a journey beyond imagining. Let me tell you a story. And then the storyteller, the Hakavati, tells us a story, one story that is made of many other stories. It is a story about a Lebanese expatriate who goes back to Beirut to sit by the bedside of his dying father to consider who and what he has himself become. And it is also a story about the heroic feats of the legendary Mamluk Sultan, Baybars, and about an emir who, as, as um, this is I'm quoting from the book, lived a long, long time ago, um, and his cunning wife, and about characters who are familiar to us from the Quran and the Old Testament. Um, what I loved about the book especially was its handling of language, which is English as she is not spoken in, in the United States or in Britain, but, but has all the texture and the feeling of another language underneath and that seeps through, uh, which is something that I think is really hard to do and which I try to do and I'm not always successful, uh, but that was great. Um, in its deft weaving together of the here and now and the seemingly fantastic and far away, the book shows us that magic and reality are the same, that no matter how modern we may think we are, we are still creatures of myth and tradition. I'm going to quote Laila, Laila Halabi from the Washington Post. At this time in history, when we are constantly told stories but are seldom well entertained, al juxtaposes truth and fiction, 
contemporary lust and body tales of the past, today's grief and sorrow in the ancient world. A delightful book that should be savored, perhaps over a small cup of very thick coffee, thrice boiled with sugar and a pinch of cardamom. I <laughs> think that's about, you couldn't put it better than that. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rabbi Alamadi. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm sorry I'm late. I got stuck in traffic. And uh, that was a lovely introduction. I'm always speechless after an introduction like this. I, I sometimes, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, maybe I'm not that much of a loser. <laughs> uh, some people might disagree. Anyway. Again, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And thank you for being here. Um, I was late because uh, I decided to drive. There is a reason why I don't usually drive. I usually take BART. I, I walk everywhere. But I decided this will be quicker. <clears throat> I thought I would have more time. I thought I'd arrive at 4.30 and be able to decide what to read. That was, didn't work out. So what I'm going to do is just read my standard. It's about 25 minutes. I might cut a little piece short. Um, the book is, is about storytelling. Um, I'll, I'll read different segments from different parts of the book to give you an idea what, it, what it's like. Um, it's, the most important thing that I should say is that there's a difference between storytellers in our part of the world and over here, or even between singers uh, in our part of the world and here. Uh, there's more, shall we say, audience participation in our part of the world. They'll scream, they'll, uh, they'll encourage a singer. Uh, so I'm used to being heckled. Uh, cell phones are not interactive. So let me start. Listen. Allow me to be your God. Let me take you on a journey beyond understanding, beyond imagining. Let me tell you a story. A long, long time ago, an emir lived in a distant land, in a beautiful city, a green city with many trees and exquisite gurgling fountains whose sound lulled the citizens to sleep at night. Now, the emir had everything, except for the one thing his heart desired, a son. He had wealth earned and inherited. He had health and good teeth. He had status, charm, respect. His beautiful wife loved him. His clan looked up to him. He had a good pedicurist. <laughs> Twenty years he had been married, 12 lovely girls, but no son. What to do? He called his vizier. Wise vizier, he said, I need your help. My lovely wife has been unable to deliver me a son, as you know. Each of my 12 girls is more beautiful than the other. They have milk-white skin, as smooth as the finest silk from China. The glistening pearls of the Arabian Gulf pale next to their eyes. The luster of their hair outshines the black dyes from the land of Sindh. The oldest has 17 poets singing her praises. My daughters have given me much pleasure, much to be proud of. Yet, I yearn to see an offspring with a little penis run around my courtyard. A boy to carry my name and my honor, a future leader of our clan. I am at a loss. My wife says we should try once more, but I cannot put her through all this again for another girl. Tell me, what can I do to ensure a boy? The vizier, for the thousandth upon thousandth time, suggested his master take a second wife. Before it is too late, my lord, it is obvious that your wife will not produce a boy. We must find someone who will. My liege is the only man within these borders who has only one wife. The emir had rejected the suggestion countless times, and that day would be no different. He looked wistfully out onto his garden. I cannot marry another, my dear vizier. I am terribly in love with my wife. She can be ornery now and then, vain for sure, petulant and impetuous, silly at times, 
ill-disposed toward the help, even malicious and malevolent when angry. But still, she has always been the one for me. Then produce a son with one of your slaves. Fatima, the Egyptian, would be an excellent candidate. Her hips are more than adequate. Her breasts have been measured. A tremendous nominee, if I might say so myself. But I have no wish to be with another. Sarah offered her Egyptian slave to her husband to produce a boy. If it was good enough for our prophet, it can be good enough for us. That night, in their bedroom, the emir and his wife discussed their problem. The wife agreed with the vizier. I know you want a son, she said, but I believe it has gone beyond your desires. The situation is dire. Our people talk. All wonder what will happen when you ascend to heaven. Who will lead our tribes? I believe some may wish to ask the question sooner. I will kill them, the Emir said. Sorry, I will kill them, the Emir yelled. I will destroy them. Who dares question how I choose to live my life? Settle down and be reasonable. You can have intercourse with Fatima and she, until she conceives. She is pretty, available, and amenable. We can have our boy through her. But I do not think I can. His wife smiled as she stood. Worry not, husband. I will attend and I will do that thing you enjoy. I will call Fatima, and we can inform her of what we want. We'll set an appointment for Wednesday night, a full moon. When Fatima was told of their intentions, she did not hesitate. I'm always at your service, she said. However, if the emir wishes to, to have a son with his own wife, there is another way. In my hometown of Alexandria, I know of a woman whose powers are unmatched. She is directly descended, female line, from Ankara herself, Cleopatra's healer and keeper of the asps. If she is given a lock of my mistress's hair, she will be able to see why my mistress has not produced a boy and will give us the appropriate remedy. She never fails. But that is astounding, the emir exclaimed. You are heaven sent, my dear Fatima. We must fetch this healer right away. Fatima shook her head. Oh no, my lord. A healer can never leave her home. It is where her magic comes from. She would be helpless and useless if she were uprooted. A healer might travel, begin quests, but in the end, to come into her full powers, she can never stray too far from home. I can travel with the lock of my mistress's hair and return with the remedy. Then go you must, the emir's wife said. The emir added, and may God guide you and light your way. This is one segment. And the interaction is you could, you know, go up and down. <laughs> yes. See, that's, that's interaction. <laughs> so, um, wow, that's louder. Uh, the next segment. Hmm. Uh, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, the narrator is uh, Osama. He's 12 years old, and he has just attended his grandfather's funeral. And uh, I don't know it, how well you know about funerals in the Middle East, uh, whether they're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or Druze in this case. They tend to be a little over the top, just a teeny bit. So uh, he was, the, the narrator is close to his grandfather and he just died uh, and they took him to the funeral and he's uh, just a teeny bit overwhelmed. So his uncle uh, is trying to distract him and his uncle is uh, Uncle Jihad and the timing is probably 1973, the boy is 12, yeah. And so he's uh, trying to distract him. That's not the segment. Are you feeling bad, asked Uncle Jihad. Was it the funeral? Why did everybody have to shout so much, I asked. Aren't we Druze supposed to have silent funerals? He sipped his drink slowly, seemed to be having a conversation with the ceiling, and not me. In principle, but, in, but not in practice. For how will the dead know that we love them, he said. You know, darling, funerals used to be much more dramatic when I was your age. Believe it or not, Believe it or not, they are quieter now, more sedate. He hummed, took another sip. Why, I can just imagine what they'll be like when you're my age now. Probably no one will ever show up. 
bang, bang, and it's over. Mourners will arrive only if alcohol is being served, like at Irish funerals. I read that in Dublin, by the way. They were not terribly amused. He ran a wash, wash rag over his head. It's only the funeral, my sweet. You know, some people flagellate themselves on the first day, the third day, and the 40th. It's a never-ending process. We have crazy funerals, and that's it. We're much more sane, don't you think? I assumed the question was rhetorical. You're not buying any of this, are you? I shook my head. Well, listen. A long, long time ago, he began, when the Mongol hordes ran amok in our world, when Genghis Khan scorched the deserts of China and plundered the rest of the world, after the barbarian king had burned Baghdad to its final ember, after he massacred 100,000 in Damascus and watched the city streets covered in rivers of blood, after the Mongol general descended upon our fertile lands, my story begins. The general's brother, Tukhan, was bored. Tukhan, I asked, that's a bad pun. That's not even Syrian good. <laughs> Don't interrupt, my boy, he replied. His eyes, aloft still, were white set, dark, and revivified. I'm on a roll. Tukhan was bored. Bored, not bird? Ah, now that's bad. Listen. <laughs> Tukhan had decided to have a feast. He brought the, best, the seven best cooks in the region and demanded that they create the greatest meal that had ever been served. The cooks toiled and enslaved and came up with seven courses. The first course was exquisite, one oyster on a bed of lemon puree. Tukan ate it in one bite and wept, for the taste was glorious. To ensure that no one else would share the taste and thereby dilute his experience, Tukan had the cook beheaded. The second course was soup, a pork and apple consomme. So thin, so clear, so delectable, and its creator was beheaded. Third was sautéed sand dabs, fourth was grilled pheasant, fifth was filet mignon, off with all their heads. The sixth was rack of lamb, of course. Tukan could not believe his tongue. His jaws extended farther, moved toward the plate. Within minutes, his mouth was a hand's width in front of his face. Ah, Tukan, I said. Precisely, Uncle Jihad went on. And we killed the penultimate cook. Now, the seventh cook was Beiruti. He was no fool and was in no mood to be killed. He made creme brulee using the milk of cows that had drunk their water from the Litani River. <laughs> Tukan had his first bite and wept again. Creamy, smooth, impeccable. But before his second bite, his stomach crumbled. He licked the spoon and his stomach yiked. He had a bowel movement before the third bite and it wouldn't relent. The never ending stool. <laughs> Plop, plop, diarrhea, dysentery. Tukan didn't have to move, didn't have time to move. He soiled his pants and the glorious, paisley infected textile he'd been sitting on. I'm quite all right, Tukan said, but he really wasn't. <laughs> he lost five kilos within the first hour, three more in the second, and another three in the third. Rumble, rumble, his stomach wouldn't stop self-evacuating. He refused to sleep sitting up, and had his slaves place him on the edge of his bed with his ankles in stirrups so, he could, so his stool could fire out unencumbered. Boom, boom, all night. His diarrhea was so explosive, he was hitting the wall across the, across the room, painting an abstract expressionist mural. <laughs> Nothing great, mind you. Mediocre painting informed by Lee Krasner. <laughs> by morning, Tukan was dead wasted away into a sick man. The bereaved Jenkins refused to have his brother buried in exile, for, he, for his soul would remain on earth, eternally searching for home. Jenkins would bury him among their ancestors. Grief, sadness, sorrow. A Mongol funeral march began, but grief, sadness, and sorrow 
weren't enough to commemorate a man as great as Dukan. And my uncle's voice grew deeper, more serious. No, it wasn't enough. Along the way, the funeral procession killed everything, every living thing it encountered. Entire villages, cities, men, women, children, generations of babies not yet born, animals, birds, trees, shrubs, flowers, forests. Everything was smashed along the way. From Beirut to Ulaanbaatar, a viscous trail of death and devastation to mark the funereal journey. He gulped the rest of his scotch. I waited for him to say something. I guess we have it, I guess we have it better now, I said. He smiled, nodded. I laughed nervously. So, when did he marry Rita Hayworth? Stop that, my uncle laughed. That's another story. Now, now you're telling me that Genghis Khan destroyed Beirut as well. I thought it was Hulagu who conquered the Middle East. Should I trust you? Never trust the teller, he said. Trust the tale. I wish I had a scotch. <laughs> How are we in time? Because I have different, well, it's 4.30, 5.30. Okay, okay. Third segment. We're getting better at this. So this is Uncle Jihad again, but this time he's telling um, his story of when he was 12 or 13. Uh, how he grew up. Uh, so the time would be 1943, approximately, uh, in Beirut. My father has his pigeon stories, and I have mine, for life, like a good tale, repeats itself. I noticed my first flock of pigeons in the skies of Beirut when I was a boy of 13. They were always there, but like most people, I'd been oblivious. Notice their existence once, and you begin to see them everywhere, all the time. I saw my first flock, and ten minutes later I saw my second, and then my third and fourth. All of a sudden, my skies brimmed with pigeons. One afternoon, while admiring a flock in flight, I began to guess at the presence of magic. I was able to discern the art, as well as the logic, of flight patterns. The realization was both gradual and instantaneous. Magic. And as soon as I had my epiphany, my eyes understood where to look for the locus of the sorcery. Though I couldn't see him, the wizard himself must have been on the roof of the old three-story building just below the school. The following afternoon, I ran to the building and asked about the pigeons. The shopkeeper on the ground floor told me to go up to the roof. The pigeon fancier, an aged man, realized I was a smitten boy. He allowed me to walk around and look at his prize collections. There were five cages on the roof, each of them bigger than my bedroom. One cage, one cage had young pigeons of different breeds, another had only coupled pigeons. One was empty because the birds were being flown. I walked around and fell in love. I wanted to say something clever so that the pigeoneer would like me and I'd be able to visit again, but my mind was numb. He was obviously a gentleman, but I wondered whether he'd let me come up a second time or a third. Would he quickly tire of a young boy who wanted to spend time with pigeons? I got scared and stuttered, can I work for you? The pigeoneer looked me up and down. He smiled and shook his head no. He said I was too young and obviously from too good of a family to work for him. I went from taciturn to loquacious in less than a second. I told him that I could come every day after classes. He was only a few meters from the school, and I was a fast learner and would do whatever he asked and never complain. And I looked like I was from the mountains, and my family was still up there, but I really wanted to make the pigeon fly, and he should tie me out. <laughs> it became obvious that he was trying his best not to laugh out loud. He said he could only afford one lira a week, which was a fortune, and he knew it. Had I walked away when he told me he wouldn't hire me, I would have failed the first test of a pigeoneer. He always said he knew the instant I came to the roof that I would end up one, that he saw, that he saw it in the obsessive twinkle in my eyes. 
The man's name was Ali Itani. He was Shiite and he owned the old building, which had no, elev which had no elevator, I should add. I showed up to work the following afternoon and found him arguing vociferously with Kamal Hurani, a man who looked like his identical twin, except he was a Catholic. You, brother of a whore, wouldn't know what honor was if it smacked you on the side of the head, one would say. And the other would reply, honor? You, lowlife, want to talk to me about honor? They were both 71 at the time, and they wore the exact same clothes, except for the shoes, checkered navy blue shirts and tailored pants that were worn and frayed. Ali's shoes were black moccasins, whereas Kamal's were burgundy, both pairs comfortably needed by years of wear. Though their insults were getting worse and worse, they were standing close to each other in a relaxed posture. My Sherlock Holmes mind reasoned that their arguing was a common occurrence. It turned out that Ali Aitani and Kamal Hurani had been best friends since they were six years old. They both swore to me that they had been ins insulting each other nonstop since 1898. <laughs> they had lived through schooling, work, marriage, family rearing, widowhood, two occupying powers, one great war, numerous small wars, religious conflicts, and independence without ever thinking of seizing their insults. I felt I had entered the garden. <laughs> that was my first interaction with the great city of Beirut. Of course, I had been living there for over seven years since I was five, but it seemed that I had only been a tourist. Like all cities, Beirut has many layers, and I had been familiar with one or two. What I was introduced to that day with Ali and Kamal was the Beirut of its people. You take different groups, put them on top of each other, simmer for a thousand years, keep adding more and more strange tribes, simmer for another few thousand years, salt and pepper with religion, and what you get is a delightful mess of a stew that still tastes delectable and exotic, no matter how many times you partake of it. These men seem to have been together for eons. And since they'd run out of conversation long ago, all that was left was ribbing and mockery and repeating the great tales to each other. At the first lull in the faux shouting match, Ali noticed me standing there, pointed at me and said, this is the young man I told you about. Without even allowing him to finish the sentence, Kamal yelled, run away, young pup, run as fast as your legs can take you. Stay away from this invertebrate of a man whose only intention is to worm his way into the life of his betters and feed on their loves, for he has none of his own. See, I told you I had found home. <laughs> of course, Ali told me to ignore Kamal and began to explain my duties. I had assumed that I'd be cleaning up after the pigeons and feeding them, but he already had another boy for that. You know, he surprised me. He wanted me to seduce the birds. A confounding task, if I say so myself. Make them fall in love with you, Ali said. I want the pigeons to want to return home for you. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I must have stood there staring at him like a fool, which elicited gales of laughter from the two old coots. Don't worry, young pup, Kamal said. You'll soon understand lazy brain speech. He wants you to go into the cages with the birds and get them used to you. It's another one of those easy tasks that lazy brain can't master. <laughs> so, my job was to be with the pigeons, spend time in the cages, hold them, and pet them if they let me. That's what I understood, and that's what I did for the first few days. I'd show up after school. The elderly twins would be chatting up a storm and arguing about little things and big things. I thought at first that there was nothing they could agree on, but I was wrong, of course. They could both agree that it was a lot of fun to tease me. Are you loving those two tumblers enough, Kamal would ask. And Ali would add, look at that lemon. She seems to be moping because you're not paying enough attention to her. I'd get so flustered that I'd walk to the pigeons they were talking about, and the pigeons would move out of my reach. I thought I could never get them to love me. Yes, I was that gullible. There was a wonderful pair of Istanbuls that I admired a great deal. Beautiful to look at, dark gray feathers speckled with white, and an orange chest that seemed to have been inflated with an air pump. They'd grown to an immense size, as big as chickens. They were inseparable, and the cock seemed totally smitten with his mate. He'd coo to her, and she loved it. Four or five days after I had started, I was watching them, and my world seemed to shrink to the size of those lovers. 
She strolled on the ground, jerkily pecking at seeds, and he followed her every step, cooing and engrossed. She stopped and turned toward him, and he nuzzled her neck. Then he started to stroll, and she followed. You're beautiful, I said to them. I realized that I had spoken out loud to a pair of birds. I looked around, and the twins seemed amused. You do know how to pick your boys, Kamal said to Ali. It was the first time I'd heard one address the other without a slur. After that, the volcano released its pressure, and I began to talk to the pigeons incessantly. I talked to them about everything. I told them how lovely they were. I warned them about the dangers of the world, complimented them on their choice of partners. I talked and talked, and Ali and Kamal had found the boy who was going to entertain them for a long time. The pigeons did respond. They may not have understood a word I said, but they began to enjoy the sound of my voice. When I ran out of things to say, I'd just prattle. And you can probably figure out what happened. I talked and talked, and one day I started on what I do best. For my audience, pigeons and humans, I began to tell stories. Thank you. That sounded a little more serious than it's supposed to be, but um, uh, so we could go to questions, or I could talk about libraries, Lebanese libraries. Okay, briefly, I'll be brief because this is sort of a plea. About four years ago, I was having one of my weekly depressions. You know, maybe daily depressions. Uh, and I was thinking that, you know, I'm, my life is meaningless and all I do is sit at home and write and I've got no friends, no social life, and I don't do anything that's of any worth. And uh, my mom agreed. <laughs> so I thought that I should do something with my life and uh, that I decided that I'm going to take on a really big project and I'm going to take on uh, the Lebanese Public Library. I'm going to create uh, Lebanese Public Libraries. Because I, uh, when I was growing up, I used the school library, and then one of the most amazing thing happens when I came over here, I discovered interlibrary loan. Heaven. Heaven. Uh, and I then discovered the libraries, and, and I thought, you know, because uh, I read a great deal when I was a boy, I read any book that came my way, and uh, I was, by the time I came, uh, became 11 or 12, I was restricted to reading uh, Harold Robbins, because that's where the only book around. And I highly recommend him as a 12-year-old. It's all about sex. <laughs> highly, highly recommend him. You know, if you ever drop a Harold Robbins book, go to any, any library and just drop a Harold Robbins book, it'll open up to the best parts. <laughs> Always. So anyway, I thought that I would like the, every Lebanese to have the opportunity to, to go into a library and pick up a book. Um, and I got all excited and I started contacting people. And then one uh, person asked me, said, well, wouldn't it be easier if you contacted the Lebanese public libraries? <laughs> and it turned out we do have them. Nobody knows about them. There is... Um, a, a group of people who have been doing everything that I wanted to do. They're an organization called as um, and uh, they are the friends of the public libraries in Lebanon. Um, so they saved me a lot of trouble, and I could now go back to being a loser who sits at home and does nothing but write books. <laughs> but what was important is um, I decided to help. Uh, for the last four years, I've been doing everything I can to help. Uh, my motto is uh, drop books, not bombs. Um, they're a great organization. They, uh, if you, I mean, they're always looking for money, but that's not exactly the most important thing. What is really important is books. Uh, if you have books and you'd like to send them, you can get access uh, through my webpage, it's myname.com, and under projects, you could go to their website and they would love to hear from you. Uh, you know, money, books, not, I mean, uh, I was told once, not academic books, because everybody seems to dump their academic books on them. <laughs> uh, 
uh, they're looking for fiction, you know, just uh, particularly young adult fiction, because uh, that's who come to the library. They have a bookmobile that goes into towns that, you know, have been bombed out, and, and it's the, one of the few organizations in Lebanon that is uh, secular, non-sectarian, so it goes into every single uh, part in Lebanon. You know. Highly recommended and a good cause. And it makes me feel good even though I sit at home and do nothing but write and be a loser. Uh, that's my spiel. So, questions? Questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I was one of the first. Uh, sorry, he asked if I do work with Helem. Helem is the uh, gay Lebanese uh, human rights group. Uh, and yes, yeah. I used to work a lot more before they were Helem, um, when they were still arguing, and then became Helem, and they no longer needed me. I've raised, I've done fundraising for them, that's about it. Yeah, and I know everybody there. Good group, too. Yes. I, I keep thinking about doing that. Unfortunately, I, that would be too much work. Setting up an entire public library system is not, but collecting <laughs> books is. <laughs> uh, no, I have not done that yet. I have not done that yet. The most I've done is, is send money. But uh, I've been planning, actually, to just contact publishers, because uh, my agent is also Lebanese. Um, and, you know, just blackmail them. Um, but I haven't done that yet. But someday, maybe after this novel is done. Do you collect books in French? Yes, yes. They actually have books in uh, English, French, and Arabic. The French, they have the uh, French government, with all its problems, is still a good government when it comes to helping uh, other countries. They send a lot of books. It's it's. Uh, the organization is also spent, uh, sponsored by the city of Paris, uh, so they get, I mean, they always need more, but they get quite a bit. Um, what they actually lack, unfortunately, is uh, books in Arabic, because Arabic publishers don't make that much money, so they don't send them books. Um, they also have books in Armenian, um, which is the fourth language in Lebanon, and they also have books, and they're looking for books in uh, Sri Lankan, because there's a huge Sri Lankan community in Lebanon of uh, domestic workers. Uh, and there is one library that in Beirut that specializes in just that. I wasn't going to ask this because it's a rude question, but you referred to this novel. So I have to ask, what are you working on now? Uh, I am writing the worst novel ever written. <laughs> ever, 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 ever written. <laughs> and I think I'm succeeding. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's it's a uh, it's an old uh, line that uh, somebody asked John Huston. Uh, uh, he there was like, which was your favorite film and that you made? And he said, well, I don't know which of mine is is my favorite or the best, but I can tell you that the one I'm working on now is the worst film I've ever made. And yeah, mm. sure. No, actually, I, I wrote them in, in that order. Um, I'm, uh, I have, I want to keep, I kept, uh, for some reason, I'm self-deprecating. I had a bad day today. If I, I never, ever, while having a bad day, decide, look in the mirror and go, oh my god, what are these hairs growing out here? And then try to get the trimmer to do this, like, <laughs> and then dry for an hour. Yes, but other than that, it's been not my bad. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> did you write yes, I did. I did. I did it. I did it uh, linearly. One of the few talents I have is the ability to actually hold things spatially, um, so that I had the stories. I had what I had. I had an idea of what I wanted to do, and I wrote it out sequentially. Some things were changed. But then I also had a really good friend who's a very good editor, and she's the one who shook it out. And uh, then you know, it, it had the same thing. The sort of the same sequences, but uh, her, she did an incredible job. Um, 
she put them, uh, she put them, she made it make more sense, uh, other than also taking 200 pages out. Uh, I always joke that she turned it, uh, I started out with the 1812 overture, you know, and she turned it into a, you know, valse. But uh, a friend of mine told me, no, she turned it into the 1801 overture <laughs> without the fireworks. Uh, but yes, I, the first draft was 1,300 pages. Yeah, I had seriously expected that people will be willing to sit down and read 1,300 pages, um, which I think they should. Uh, but um, they, I mean, there were certain things in my head that I realized afterwards had to be taken out, so the process of cutting was really interesting. Yes? I, I, I've thought about this for a lot. Uh, I'm a reader. Um, it's been my experience. I, I like my interaction with a book. Uh, I find it difficult uh, when I get to know a, another writer. Um, I tend to lose my perspective. If I like the writer, I will like the book. If I don't like the writer, I won't like the book, <laughs> and, which is a problem. Um, and then I had somebody recently tell me, I'm not going to look in his direction, that the second time he read the book, after he got to know me, it sounded as if I was speaking to him directly, as in, because he knows my voice. And, and I actually think that's a bad thing. You know, we're getting to the point where writers are now um, public figures. And we get to know a lot more than I think we should. You know, of course, we know a lot about uh, past writers who were dead, um, but I th I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult. I'm finding it difficult. I like to be have an intimate relationship with a book. Um, it's one of my things. Uh, so in public, I put on a persona. I'm slightly ditzy. I'm very ditzy in person. I'm less ditzy in public. Um, it becomes, it becomes sort of a performance thing. And there are lots of writers who are actually, like, it, it takes a completely different skill to be in front of a public and read uh, than it, is the, it takes to write. And a lot of writers don't have those skills. Um, I, I mean, luckily, I have not had a book um, yet that has been, uh, uh, done as an audiobook. Uh, otherwise, I think I'd shoot myself. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. It just would sound weird. And then, meant, well, uh, there was talk about doing an audiobooks with me reading it, and I thought my mouth would dry out. <laughs> I just can't imagine. Hmm. But it's done. I, I, have, I have listened to one audiobook. It didn't work. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, you're an artist as well. I'm wondering how you balance those two forms of expression. I don't. I don't. I, uh, I'm, <clears throat> first of all, uh, Vikram said I'm renowned. My mother knows who I am as an artist. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm, I can't, uh, I'm not very good at multitasking. Um, once I started writing, I stopped painting. And I actually had reached a plateau in my painting. I, I stopped at the top. <laughs> but I, I've done this. Be, before I painted, I used to, uh, I mean, I always tell this. It's become sort of a standard joke. I used to raise orchids. Uh, and I had quite a lot of them. And then I started um, raising bonsais, growing bonsais. When I got the bonsais, the orchids died. <laughs> when I started painting, the bonsais died. <laughs> When I started writing, I still paint, but it's, it's now a hobby, you know, which is a, a big difference. Um, uh, there's a difference for me. I still have orchids. I don't have a bonsai, too much work. Uh, but it's, there's, uh, I'm obsessive. When, I, uh, like when I'm working on a novel right now, 
everything that I do is, you know, it's like somebody asks me a question in my head, you know, how could I use that in my novel? Nothing else matters. Um, when I was painting, I, everything I did was about painting. There's a, it's like I could still paint, I could probably do the exact same painting, but I can't call myself a painter. I actually never knew anything about pigeons. <laughs> Just made it all up. I mean, I don't know anything about pigeons. I've never heard a hakawati. I've never heard a storyteller live. I probably would be bored to tears. Uh, I'd never played the guitar or the oud or I'd know nothing about it. It's all made up, all of it. I mean, well, that's the point. <laughs> it's, the point is not to tell the truth. The point is to create a truth. Yes? Yes. My father, before he died, reminded me that when I was four, he asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I wanted to be a writer. I was talking about Superman comics, but I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> I, I wanted to write comic books. And then, after that, I wanted to write like Enid Blyton. Desperately, like Enid. I thought she was God's gift to humanity. And then Harold Robbins. I could do Harold Robbins. <laughs> And then, you know, you just moved up. And then I think it was, I don't think, if, if, until I got to V.S. Naipaul, and then I realized I wanted to be V.S. Naipaul. And then I met him, and I said, no, I don't want to be V.S. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? They, sorry, they, for me, everybody can write. And I, and I think everybody should. I don't think everybody should get published, but, you know, <laughs> everybody should write. But there's a certain obsessiveness about it. Uh, and, and actually speaking of V.S. Naipaul, in, in, uh, particularly in a book called The Way in the World, uh, he talks about how he knew he was a writer when he was reading a book and seeing and reading it as if he, uh, and crit critiquing the writer, and what would he do that he realized he was a writer. And then that started, that's, it becomes an obsession, like how would you do it, how would I do it? But why is this working? You know, um, and it's an interesting switch because once I, you know, this is, it's a long philosophical discussion, but something happens at one point where you no longer read. I am no longer a reader. I became a writer, and actually, I think that was bad because you know I no longer can read uh, as well or as, as be in love with books as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still read a lot and I love books, but there was a time when I was a teenager where I could be lost for days, just completely lost. I mean, I could be in a library and nobody would know I was there, ever. And I used to think, I had this dream uh, that I would one day be incarcerated and they'd let me have books. <laughs> that I would be able to not do anything but read, because, you know, my parents had me do chores. Uh, that was my dream. See, uh, does the big L for losers still show? <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Mm, I could. Um, I always love these questions. Because everybody assumes I'm a pundit, you know, I'm sitting up here. Let me tell you what I think about Lebanon. Uh, I really don't know. I really don't. I mean, uh, I spend about four months of the year over there. Um, my family's all there. Um, you know, I mean, I can tell you my sister's really worried because my nephew is seven and uh, he hurt himself the other day playing soccer. Uh, my eldest sister, my sorry, middle sister, her daughter is just 18 and she graduated from high school and she's going to university so she's really worried about, you know, will she be and, able to handle the course load and how will she ever interrupt her courses, her, you know, she's watching Friends constantly. And <laughs> will she be able to watch Friends and go to university at the same time? <laughs> um, well, that's the whole point. <laughs> It's it's a day to day life is the same. Mm -hmm. um, we're a little crazier. Um, 
but it's, I mean, for me, Lebanon is about being with family and being around people. The political situation, I don't know. I really have no clue. You know, I mean, as long as we have neighbors who constantly have to prove whose dick is bigger than whose, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. It's like Israel goes, mine is bigger, and then Syria goes, no, mine is bigger. <laughs> While normal people go on with their life. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, my family, my family were able to get out and they didn't. They spent the entire war there. There's a few people in this room who have. Uh, yes, yeah. it, it's hard, it's difficult. Um, it's a bad neighborhood. I mean, one of the things that really fascinates me is why the Israelis want to be in that neighborhood. I mean, you know, couldn't you? Upper East Side is so much better. <laughs> Like it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's, it's life. I mean, one of the things that I've always loved, and I always call it home and, and love it, is because uh, there's something that happens in crisis. In my first book, I actually said, you know, crisis awakens. You know, for the most part, most of us go through life comatose. When you're having like a real crisis, you wake up a little bit. Lebanon wakes you up constantly. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Rabbi Alamadine for being here. I think it was wonderful to have a storyteller like him kick off our year. So again, I'd like to remind you that books are available over here. The author will sign in the back corner there. Thank you again for coming and have a wonderful evening. I hope to see you next month. In October, we'll have David Sheff.